And we have achieved our goal of having more people in the audience than presenters, so step one is achieved. Um, so uh, we're used to being stuck behind kind of an impersonal email alias, so it's, it's fun to be here and see people uh, in person, smiling faces, all that. So before we start talking about ourselves, questions for people in the audience. How many people are software vendors? Security researchers, cool, oops, IT pros, all right, schadenfreude fans, just people here, all right, cool, glad to see representation there, uh, just here for the food, I guess our food is uh, coming up soon, anyway, um, so this that's cool, we got a good cross section here and we can kind of tailor our talk to, to the audience. Okay, so introducing ourselves, um, I'm Wendy Poland, and as Dave mentioned, we're part of the Adobe Product Security Incident Response Team, otherwise known as PCERT, which we'll use that acronym quite often. Uh, it's a subgroup of ASSET at Adobe, which is the Adobe C Secure Software Engineering Team. And um, I'm actually located here in the East Coast in our Boston office, which is in Waltham. And a little bit about myself, I have a program management background, and I've previously worked at At Stake and Symantec. Cool. So I'm, I'm Dave. I'm Product Security Program Manager. Um, I've worked for about five years on PCERT, um, a bit longer than that, um, going back to the Macromedia days. Um, and I've worked, uh, basically in my background, I worked on the Dreamweaver pro product at Macromedia. Um, most notably, I guess, a QA manager on the Dreamweaver product. Um, so what you see here is a picture of my cube. Uh, if you can't tell, it's covered in uh, tinfoil. So this happened when I was on my sabbatical, which is a great Adobe benefit we get. Um, so I came back covered in tinfoil. There's some saran wrap in there, I don't know. The tinfoil, obviously, to block the signals. I'm not sure what the saran wrap is for. And you'll see my nickname there apparently um, is Zero Dave. So kind of not, not the best nickname. But And this is our San Francisco office. So a brief overview of PCERT. Um, I'm not going to get into to depth here. See the pirate flag. Um, we're pirates. We're also ninjas. You'll see ninjas later. Um, so got some grandiose ideas about ourselves. Um, so we receive reports via PCERT at adobe.com. That's the alias. We've got a web forum on our website to report vulnerabilities as well. 90% uh, plus of the vulnerabilities are responsibly disclosed, so thank you to the security researchers here who report stuff to us. Uh, sorry? Um, so yeah, thanks to the security researchers. That's a, a huge part of what we do. Um, Wendy and I, the two of us, handle most of the correspondence, but we got a lot of people behind the scenes. We've got um, technical contacts on the PCERT team, um, security researchers as well as uh, proactive um, security researchers on that, the overarching um, umbrella group, ASSET. Um, and we have researchers on product teams as well um, and security-focused developers. So the bullseye on our back. We get it. Um, we have, uh, we understand that we're a target. Um, we've got ubiquity, we've got 98% plus of desktops. Uh, so we understand that, we're reacting to that. Um, and we call it the ubiquity tax, basically. Our runtimes, uh, reader, flash player, and air, they're, they're everywhere. So that, that's why we're focused. Um, and we're responding to the added attention we're getting. Um, so, and you know, that's why we're here. Uh, and the last thing here, Although we mean our feature set to be used for benevolent purposes, this quote from our founder shows, you know, the bad guys are resourceful, so. So this is um, a, a metric, just a, a quick chart showing the number of valid vulnerability reports that we receive per quarter. You can see it's trending upwards a bit. Um, so this is a, this is a handy metric to show to, for instance, executives. Um, 
they know that we're a focus. We, they know that um, a lot of stuff is going around on around security for Adobe. Um, but this just reinforces it, obviously. And anything else? Yeah, so um, just to note, all these uh, vulnerabilities are not reported against Reader or Flash Player. Um, in fact, the number of uh, reports going against Reader is actually going down. Um, but one thing, uh, when your name is out there um, in the security community, uh, basically any products that are associated with your name become a target. So um, we get reports against products that we didn't even know we supported anymore. So fun stuff like that. So what we're going to talk about, um, the best way to understand what we do is to walk through a case study. So we're going to talk about a zero day that happened and just kind of walk through some of the steps that, that happened. So that should be instructive and show you what we do. And what we hope you'll get out of this talk, if, if you're a vendor, obviously, hopefully you'll learn what, um, from what has happened to us. We've learned from what other soft, software companies have done. Um, you know, for instance, Microsoft. Um, and hopefully you can learn from us. Or, and as well, we want you to learn about what, what we're doing to protect customers. Um, and if you're a researcher, you can, you know, you can laugh at our misfortune, um, stuff like that. So we've got dedicated security resources, as we talked about. Um, I, I don't want to get too in-depth here, but we have proactive work going on. Um, everything that you would hope and expect we would do, uh, threat modeling and static code analysis, um, fuzzing, uh, secure build flags, stuff like that. Um, we're going to talk about a certification program, asset certification program that we have internally. It's a homegrown thing that we did. Uh, so we're proud of it, so we'll, um, we'll describe that. Um, and on the P-Cert side, Wendy and I, in a lot of ways, um, we bridge the gap between the proactive and the reactive. So people on the front lines, like the IT admins and the researchers, and then the people um, on the, the back end who are doing the development within Adobe. if we can manage. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our workflow. Uh, as Dave mentioned, we get um, information from a variety of channels, um, most often uh, researchers. We also, though, um, get information from support team, customers, of course, um, public postings, and uh, internal notifications. Once we receive this type of information, we go through a process to track it and, um, and basically make sure that we're tracking it from time of report all the way through. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is we have a triage team as part of PCERT to obviously um, make sure reports are valid um, and once so determine criticality of those uh, reports. Um, then once we've triaged it, we're obviously also working with the product team. They do their own triage. Um, and asset is often involved, that's more of our proactive piece, um, and they're pretty much involved from start to finish. Um, they'll look at the triage to make sure we're looking at all different components. Um, they'll be a part of workaround uh, conversations, the ultimate fix, thinking about the schedule, and um, of course making sure all proactive measures are updated along the way. Uh, communication, of course, with the external researchers is very important to us, and we make sure that we are keeping that communication um, going along the way. Uh, then, of course, ultimately, the product team creates the patch and fix, and um, we'll be working on making sure the bulletin details are released. Um, we will have a verification uh, process to make sure that, of course, the fix ultimately fixes the issue. Um, the product team QE is involved, um, PCERT, of course, gets re-involved, our triage team, to double check. Uh, and again, asset researchers potentially will throw it back to them to double check as well. Um, and then ultimately, we'll uh, post it to the public so everyone is aware of the fix. OK, so we're going to talk about um, a case study, as Dave mentioned. Uh, we're specifically going to talk about the doc.media.newplayer issue. Um, that's the CVE. 
Um, so there was a variety of articles about it. Um, we're going to walk through this real life issue so you can see the piece cert workflow in process and kind of see um, along the way um, what we did regarding this particular issue as well as digress into some related topics and uh, maybe take some lessons learned um, to either what you do um, and certainly we always appreciate feedback um, at the end. Okay, so let's dive right in. It was Tuesday, December 14th. Let me just set it up for you. Uh, things were quieting down because the holidays were around the corner. And our January Adobe Reader and Acrobat re release was um, coming up, so we were finalizing preparation. I think I even said to Dave, it's a little quiet, a little too quiet. And... That's what did it. Bam. <laughs> uh, this was the email, and uh, Besides, of course, the attention-grabbing uh, text, um, there are we definitely have a lot of trusted sources uh, that contact contact us where we sit up and take notice. And um, Stephen Adair is part of the Shadow Server organization. Um, he's definitely one of the trusted sources. So we, you know, definitely said, all right, we got to take a look at this. Um, just as a sidebar note, um, Shadow Server often learns of issues through the assistance of their partners, just to show you the extent of the communication lines. And um, they monitor uh, security-related anomalies, and if they find anything interesting around um, Adobe products, they definitely get in touch with us. And um, he wanted to make sure you know, that that communication line is definitely happening, and we appreciate it. Um, but as seen, it's as simple as that. An email can come in and completely change your day. Uh, it definitely did for us. But then again, that's how it is. That's what we're prepared for on, as far as incident response. Um, ultimately, other pa uh, partners of ours contacted us with um, similar information, adding credibility to the report. Um, so we immediately knew there was, there was an exploit in the wild. Okay, so vast majority of the PDF exploits are definitely of known fixed issues. Um, they take advantage of those that are not on the latest, most secure version. Um, we definitely have very few zero days um, where exploits are used in limited target attacks. However, this was not that. It was definitely uh, not a good sight to see this. So um, this is, of course, where all the preparation and training gets put to the test. Um, and I believe this is how Dave got his nickname. <laughs> so, uh, so now what? Um, as mentioned before in our work workflow, um, one of the first things we do is we talk to our triage team as part of PCERT. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, is this thing really real? At the same time, we're obviously sending it to the affected product team, and um, ASSET is also um, a part of this process, considering if any other products are affected. Um, we definitely have the duplicate triage as far as the product team as well as PCERT, um, and that's to double check the validity of the vulnerability, but as well as, as I mentioned at the back end, once a fix comes through, uh, to make sure that it is, in fact, um, fixing the issue, uh, just as a double set of eyes on it. Um, and in this case, and I'm going to read here because uh, I want to make sure I get this right, it was called a uh, print D issue. Um, everyone thought it was a print D or util.print D, as that was the last JavaScript class called before the issue caused a crash. Um, so it wasn't very obvious where the bug was immediately, but uh, after some investigation and pulling things apart, uh, we determined print D was not actually relevant. The util.print line of code was only required to properly format the PDF file so the media.new player would execute. Um, as mentioned, I've got the management background, not the technical, so I want to make sure I get this right. Uh, the exploit was actually a format string bug in the doc.media.new player function. And um, we realized it uses a use after free condition, which is within the doc.media.new player JavaScript API. So basically, the outcome is you think you're running a PDF and you're actually running an exploit. So um, there was a, definitely some initial confusion as far as the reports coming in, um, not out of malice, but certainly uh, just because of um, this print D um, call. So we definitely, by taking the time to verify what was really happening, um, allowed us to proceed with more accuracy. And this is definitely something Adobe takes very seriously um, to make sure that the validity of um, everything we're processing is correct. Okay. So back to December 14th. So our triage has confirmed the issue is real. Um, we know this thing is a real zero day. 
So communication starts to happen, and of course, there's nothing better than getting a meeting request um, about a zero day. Uh, definitely gets a lot of people's attention. Um, there's a lot of different communication vehicles that we're, we're um, putting in play, a lot of different audiences that we're talking to. Um, as mentioned, we're definitely having conversation with the researchers that have reported the issue to us, um, partners and, and then some, keeping them in, of the loop um, of what we're finding, our investigation, so that communication is open. Um, we're obviously talking to the product team, and as mentioned, if there's any other product teams um, affected, we're making sure that that uh, communication is ongoing. Um, ACID is very much involved. Um, we also are working with our executive level to make sure they're informed as necessary, considering this is um, uh, very, uh, to, um, very important to the company. Uh, PR is involved, and then ultimately we're thinking about how we need to talk to the public. Um, just as a sidebar, another tool we use at Adobe is the Adobe Connect tool. Um, in this case, we used it as a war room. It was very helpful um, because we left it up 24-7 so that we could have live updates of the issue and what was being talked about. Um, so that for, therefore, it wasn't time zone specific. Anybody around the world could um, jump in since we have a lot of product teams and development all over the world. Um, and we can be specific on who can access, um, so we could be very careful with the information we were sharing here since um, in Connect you can, um, you can uh, prevent entrance into the room by the room's owner, owner and in this case it was the PSERT team. Um, and plus another versatile option was that it's got a chat version, a uh, chat option in it, so that we could jump in and, and quickly talk about what was going on. And we definitely use Connect a lot um, for video and presentation as well. Okay. All right, so um, we charitably called this a demo, so don't, don't get too excited. Um, so I'm just going to show you um, kind of what the vulnerability looked like, uh, if I can get the VM running. That's not the way to do it. Ah, I'm going to have to log in. Sorry, hold on. The resolution is all messed up. La di da. So, um, what I'm going to show you here, as as mentioned, is the um, the vulnerability itself. If I, if I can actually get the resolution. Okay. So, and purpose of uh, showing you the vulnerability is really more to show you um, what the workaround looked like. So, the properties is probably somewhere where I can't see it. Fun stuff. Let's try. It. Must be what it is, right? Okay. So, this is uh, one of the the first um, POCs we got in Util Print D. You can see it's still called that. So, no gnarly exploit is going to run. Um, you can see where things are not going well. Um, just to give you an idea of what might have happened. And if you're if you're looking at your screen, you might want to look up just briefly um, at the picture here. It's a pretty good one. Um, so as I said, that uh, besides being an excuse to show you this picture, which um, I'll take that excuse, um, the idea there is just to show you. We'll we'll get back to this later. It'll pay off. I swear, kind of. So, um, so let's stop in a, and just take a second here. Um, definitely, uh, communication is very key for us, and we've definitely expanded our partner base. Um, we want to talk to more of you. Uh, our product teams are also networking as well, so that's multiplying our touch points. And um, certainly to the researchers, um, if you have something to say, we want to hear about it. Um, we want to um, know what's going on. 
IT pros, for those of you on the front lines, we want to hear your pain points and um, we want that feedback so we can um, pack that into our processes. And obviously for any vendors in the room, um, we definitely want to keep that communication open because uh, we know together we can fix these issues faster. So um, another communication channel that we use is our PSERP blog. Um, we use it as a very formal space for announcing issues, um, workarounds, advisories, and ultimate bulletins. Um, it's usually followed most often by the press and customers. And um, I know our PR definitely says it's the communication um, for when we communicate about, um, about bulletins and ultimate fixes. And we often tell our customers to get an RSS feed to the blog so they know immediately, um, because we literally, within seconds, once a bulletin's live, we post the PSERP blog. So you know once this thing comes up, um, you have the most up-to-date up information. Uh, so back to our case study, at this point, um, we needed to acknowledge the issue to the public, and uh, we used the PSERP blog to do so. So this helped us transition uh, reactive reporting about the issue. Um, to making sure we got to the next steps. What's the work workaround? Um, what else can we supply the, the public so that we can move forward? And we got a question. Yeah. Absolutely. Fire away. Yeah. In, in this case, it was um, a few hours. Yeah. 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 Those, we we want to make sure we got the information right. Um, um, so we we posted at four o'clock. Um, so and we got the first email I think like one o'clock. So it was within yeah. three hours. Yeah. 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 All right. So um, I'm going to ask you guys to indulge me again. Um, indulge me with the Sylvester Stallone picture. So. Um, we're going to digress here and talk a little bit about our certification program, um, mainly because it's, it's a homegrown program and we think it's really cool. In this case, the applicability is um, it, uh, the entire reader team had gone through our certification program, so we didn't have to do a great deal of like context setting and giving background info. Um, once this issue hit, we were able to um, speak a common language, um, concepts, people, we're all familiar with them. So. So it was really helpful from, from that perspective. Um, so uh, an overview of the program, uh, it's a based on a belt system, and that's why you see this uh, cute ninja character here. Um, so being at a creative company, uh, we can get little like logos like this, which is kind of cool. Um, so as I said, it's entirely ho homegrown, so we use uh, the Connect tool uh, which is an e-learning tool. I'll show you in a minute what it looks like. Um, but it was de developed by asset researchers and also with, uh, with help from the product teams. There are different pra tracks for uh, program managers or quality assurance engineers or developers um, because obviously different audiences need different information. Um, so yeah, it, there's different levels of security achievement based on the, the belt that you get. We'll talk a little bit more about the belts. Uh, and we have top-down support for this program, um, but it's actually been really, um, really effective from a grassroots perspective. Uh, part of that, I think, is the belts. It's cheesy, totally cheesy. I, I understand that, but people like belts. Um, so if you're a green belt or you know you want your brown belt, <laughs> no, you don't get a belt. We haven't gotten quite there. Um, you do get a, uh, you, you get a badge. I'll, I'll show you what the badge looks like on your. So we have like an internal social networking information site. You get a badge on there, and people people are psyched to get their the badges. Um, yeah. So the uh, the other aspect there is um, security is a growth industry right now, as, as you might have noticed. So uh, it's it's a cool way for people to differentiate themselves. Um, if you're a developer, a QE, like if you hook yourself onto the security wagon. Um, it's, it's a cool way to kind of grow your career. It's also obviously an interesting topic and a lot of drama and stuff like that, so um, it attracts people. So yeah, in this case we get um, this grassroots support and that's really effective versus kind of like a top-down mandate, you know, shoving it down people's throats. So um, we found that 
that's uh, what, what's happened is in each product team there's uh, like a security minded subset and then there's a security champion on each uh, on each product team so wow Kyle looks really tan there it's awesome I can't believe he's not in the audience here this is what he gets um, so so this is what it looks like I'll, and I'll also show you the uh, just what it looks like running um, Yeah, so, so basically there's, there are these slides. In this case, we're uh, doing like a case study with the SAMI worm to show kind of the different, um, different web stuff that was involved there. Um, so it's a, uh, a module, like a 20 to 30 minute module for each topic. And each topic um, basically you know, ties back into a belt. You, know, you, you go through 10 of these trainings and you get your white belt, or 10 or 15. There's an opt-out quiz at the end, so if like you're you know cross-site scripting something you're familiar with, you can just go through the quiz and prove to us and prove to yourself yes you do know cross-site scripting. Uh, so white belt, green belt, white belt is the um, general security knowledge uh, belt, and then the green belt gets into more depth, like deep deep dives into some of the concepts. Then the brown belt, we do the Jedi mind trick and make people do projects. Um, so like, you know, setting, setting up a f new fuzzing framework for your product or something like that. Or uh, recording a new training. Hey, how about that? Uh, and then we can use that training and make other people smarter. Um, and then Black Belt is like the person on the reader team. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that. Um, in this case, Liz McQuarrie. Uh, so she gets a little cert Secure Software Engineering Certified Black Belt. Um, so that's, that's Liz. She's, uh, she's our Zarina, security Zarina on, on the reader team. Um, so that's kind of how it works. Um, one other note there, uh, we're looking into posting some of the trainings that it would be interesting for like Flash developers, like cross-domain, um, or writing, writing secure Swifts, Get, getting those posted out to the public. Because, uh, yeah, we're pretty proud of them. They're, they're really cool, and we'd like to get them out to more people. Sorry, switch back to the slides here. Yeah, I think we showed that. All right, so just uh, real quick here. We have a secure product life cycle, and, and that's important. But the, what the certification program does is it helps us build a secure culture. Like, there's a little more cachet around you know, being um, a security guy and knowing about security. Um, and for the reader team and, and flash player team and other higher um, higher profile products, it's it's important to have buy-in across the teams, um, and and we do have that, so so it's great. We fancy ourselves, we like to fancy ourselves the domain experts in security, but for the company as a whole, it's it's better if everyone um, knows security really well. Um, and in that kind of case, we don't need to be feel like we're you know shouting against the wind or whatever. We don't need to be the voice of reason. Other people already understand the concepts and the importance. All right, so to get back to the case study, thank you for uh, listening to my um, my promotion for something that you don't even really care that much about. But um, let's take you into the room um, with us during that zero day meeting. So there's a lot of tension, um, a lot of sweaty palms. <laughs> A lot of uh, like booze jokes floating around. Um, so the kind of questions we ask ourselves in a zero day situation, how wide is the exploitation? In this case, it was targeted attacks, but we heard about it, bang, 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 from a bunch of people in succession. So, um, so it, it was starting to, to grow in volume. Um, is it already fixed? Uh, so you know, is it, is it actually already on the train to be in our next quarterly um, update, which was gonna be uh, four weeks away in January? <laughs> in this case. Um, is there a workaround? So in this case, yes. There's a JavaScript blacklist framework, which had shipped in the previous uh, quarterly update in October. So we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, some other questions. Is this kind of like a one-off issue, uh, or is this something where we need to do more testing around a particular area? So like, is, is it in like an image library or something like that, um, which 
in which case we would have to think about like is it worth X number of hours of testing right in that focused area um, in this case no it, it was just a um, like a one-off issue um, pretty simple to fix we didn't we didn't need to do a lot of testing around it <coughs> um, other other questions we ask ourselves is this in a common library that might affect other products in this case no uh, lots of other questions obviously floating around this this meeting so what we need to do is um, basically get the information on this workaround that we have, the JavaScript blacklist framework, and, um, and get, it, get it out there for customers. But we can't, we can't post it without knowing for sure that we have the right information out there. So uh, we're, we're kind of the authority here. So we can't afford to give out information that's incomplete or is going to cause problems, or you know, isn't isn't correct. So, um, so right now in this on this first day, we're doing a ton of testing to verify that we have the right uh, the right right, right workaround, the right information to get to customers. So, yeah, talked about that. So partners, um, zero day situation, getting information out to antivirus partners is really important so that they can deploy protections for our mutual customers. Uh, having a workaround is better, um, so that you can really block the exploit at the source uh, with the workaround. Back to Wendy. <laughs> oh, geez. Hun hundreds. <laughs> yeah. Um, with the reader team, um, like I said, er everyone's been through the security training and everyone has to get involved in a, in a case like this um, where we're, you know, we're basically talking about a, a release, a major release of, of reader, so. Okay, so back to our timeline. Um, amazingly, all that we've gotten up to at this point has only happened in one day. Um, so at this point, I think we, we finally crashed and uh, we got ready for day two. So um, so besides obviously the workaround, um, we also asked some other questions um, that are going to go into our security advisory, which is the next thing we want to get posted to the public as soon as possible. Uh, and that is when can we ship the patch? Um, and we definitely want to note that in our, in our advisory. Um, we really make sure that we can get that data out there so we can get that information out to our customers as soon as possible. Um, big question is, can we turn around in a two-week uh, zero-day patch or can we um, uh, slide it into our next quarterly release? As Dave mentioned, our next one was within um, four weeks, so that was definitely a consideration. Uh, we also thought about that uh, the holidays were around the corner, so if we did a zero-day um, release within two weeks, some of our customers may not even be around and not be able to schedule it. So that was part of um, considering the date. Uh, we also knew we couldn't do both. Um, we were so close to the quarterly release, uh, rele the release, uh, that if we did a zero-day patch, it would ultimately affect that release date. Um, also, obviously, we're thinking about any other information we can put into the advisory, uh, to, again, to keep as much communication out there as possible. Okay, so another communication vehicle we use um, is our security bulletins and advisories webpage, and it is just that, uh, pretty dry. Um, it's where we post all security bulletins and advisories. Uh, we always have a corresponding PCERT blog, as mentioned, because we know a lot of people have RSS feeds, uh, and the second this thing gets posted, um, we have a PCERT blog that goes up. Um, and we have corresponding information in the PCERT blog, um, and of course a link to the advisory. And we rely on the press uh, to help get the word out, um, get it to our customers so that they have this workaround, um, as Dave mentioned, so they can ultimately stop the, the exploit at its source. Okay, so that's day two. Um, so day one, we acknowledge the report, the issue's real. Day two, we've got the workaround out. Day three now, we're like, okay, what else can we communicate? What else can we tell people? Um, so another communication vehicle is our asset blog. Um, this is something we use much more frequently. It's a more casual um, communication vehicle we use. Uh, we often have uh, asset security re researchers who post here. Um, Brad Arkin, who some of 
um, at Stakers may know. He's our director of security at Adobe. Um, he'll often post blogs, uh, chime in on major security efforts that are going on. Uh, we'll post when we're attending conferences. We actually posted right before we came to Source. And um, we also provide analysis information on any other hot topics of the day. Um, so in this case, we utilize the asset blog to talk about the decision we made on why we, um, what date we used for the patch. And the two different options that were in front of us was we stop everything, we do a zero day release within two weeks um, or less if we can. And uh, we knew very well that that could affect our quarterly, quarterly release schedule, which was coming up around the corner. The other option, of course, was roll the fix into the quarterly release um, on January 12th. Two important considerations for this decision was the JavaScript blacklist mitigation, which uh, Dave's going to talk about in a bit, and uh, the customer schedules. As mentioned, holidays are around the corner. We have to factor that in. Um, are people going to be able to deploy the patch? Um, especially considering maybe a lot of people will be out on vacation um, and such. Um, the decision, of course, was we rolled this uh, fix into the quarterly release. And um, you can certainly go to the asset blog if you want to get more information. Yeah, so um, moving on to day four here. So the JavaScript blacklist, um, we had put out the information um, which gave you the workaround. And we were really curious to hear customer feedback on the JavaScript blacklist because this is the first time that we had used it in production. It was a feature that we developed and put out in the October, the October quarterly release. And the way that the JavaScript blacklist works is it, it's really simple. There's a, um, a reg key that you can use to block blacklist any um, a particular function. So in this case, doc.media.newplayer. So it's the first time it's being used. We're really, really interested to get feedback. We, we want it to work, obviously, and, and we've done a lot of testing to make sure it works. It's, it's good to hear that, you know, hear that confirmation. So in this case, we got great feedback from the customers. Um, in one instance, we had a customer, major customer, who had over 120,000 desktops, um, and they deployed it within you know 24 hours of us uh, posting the information, and th there was no negative impact, so that's great. And they actually s were monitoring and saw that uh, some of the exploits were blocked. So um, hopefully, we won't get Stallone again. So uh, we posted obviously instructions for how to to uh, implement this registry key change. We also posted registry key just to you could point and click. So I'm going to import that registry key and I'm gonna launch this again just to show you how it works. Um, so basically it's disabled. You get a message that the JavaScript was disabled. Yay. Uh, I'll show you what the reg key looks like. You know, real exciting. So a blacklist, and then we added doc.media.newplayer. So, so that's the extent of it. And we were happy to see that it worked in this case. And that's what basically um, helped us make that decision, made that decision easier for us. Um, so moving back to this timeline, you can see here uh, the 17th, we, get, we get start getting the feedback. Um, over the holidays, we're, um, we're, do we're working. The reader team is working. And they're the ones doing the real work. Um, they're actually doing testing. So uh, a lot of retesting has to happen. In this case, we've got, you know, we had the uh, quarterly security update getting prepared to be pushed out on January 12th. So there, there's a lot of holidays in that interim. Um, a lot of installer testing had already happened. That needs to be redone. We've got all these platforms and languages. Um, I, I won't go on and on about all the, the hard work that they had to do, but they did have to do it. Um, and at the same time, they're working. Um, our customers are, are deploying, uh, deploying the workaround and um, having their own issues. Um, so as uh, on the PCERT team, it, it's important for us. That, you know, PCERT never sleeps, basically. Uh, so we have weekend coverage and holiday coverage. That's stuff we have to think about. Uh, in this case, we have like a, you know, it's not just us either. It's the product teams, like key people on the product teams need to be available. Um, so we have like a phone tree, cheesy phone tree that we hand out uh, ahead of holidays. Um, so in this case, we 
we got a lot of uh, a lot of calls and emails from customers. So, you know, Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, um, you know, they have questions, they have concerns, they have comments, and sometimes they just want to yell at us, which is fine. Um, we need to be there for them to yell at us and, and get it off their chest. So um, another digression here. So working on PCERT, you know, challenges, you got to work over the holidays, happens. Product teams don't like hearing from us. So like, if you get an email from uh, Wendy or I, like, you know, sometimes product teams, they'll have like a little physical reaction. Um, so job perks, more spam. Um, so yeah, you get these emails that are, it's really, really tempting to click on the attachment. So it's just, again, if you're, if you're looking at your screen, you might want to look up here. Let's just stop and drink this in a little bit. Um, we got this email and uh, obviously, I, I don't know, maybe they stole like my World of Warcraft passwords or whatever, it was worth it just to see this picture. I don't know if you guys can see, he's got like a camera and armor and stuff. Uh, it's pretty cool. So, so that's a job perk. You can't just walk into the Adobe cafeteria. So our names are, our names and our faces are infamous, unfortunately. Um, serious file attachments. Arbitrary Facebook friends requests. This is true. Like you get these like really good looking people like wanting to be your friends. So yeah, that's, that's, it's all true. Fun stuff. All right, so back to Wendy. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, it's now four weeks after we received the report, and um, we're getting ready to ship. Um, and what goes into preparing for that ultimate uh, January 12th um, release is a lot of writing. Uh, it's a lot of what we do. <laughs> so leading up to and upon release day, um, again, communication. Communication with external and internal security researchers, making sure everyone is on the same page. Um, obviously, we're talking to those of you on the front lines, our IT admins um, and high value companies. We communicate with MITRE for CVE identifiers. Again, this is the release, so we have, besides the zero day, we have other um, issues that we'll be fixing. Uh, we coordinate with PR, uh, associated product teams, the web team, asset, list goes on and on. Um, we post the security bulletin onto our security bulletin and advisories page, as mentioned previously, and it includes uh, CVE identifiers, high-level summary, uh, details of vulnerabilities, um, solution, of course, how to get the update, and uh, acknowledgments to all those who have helped us along the way. Um, we have a corresponding PCERT blog, as mentioned, and um, we're also sending out lots of internal communications. Uh, we want to make sure everyone on the inside has the, the same information and they can provide that information to their customers. Um, we have FAQs, point of contact information. So um, definitely a lot of detail goes into um, the release from the PCERT side of the house. Okay, so once the bulletin has been released, at this point we transition from reactive to proactive. Uh, there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes. Um, Asset, PCERT, and the product teams are all talking to each other, assessing the release. Um, some of the questions that we're asking um, is, you know, we're going over the issues that were fixed um, in the this particular case study. We thought about, you know, why did we miss this particular vulnerability? Um, how can we get better? What can we do proactively to get ahead? And, and of course, all of this is happening um, from start to finish. It's not just come release day. Uh, also, of course, now that the patch is available, we'll th we're thinking about how to get it distributed. That's a big focus of ours. Uh, the press helps to get the word out for us. Um, we definitely utilize them um, to do that. The ARM updater is something um, actually Dave's going to talk about. So. Yeah, so uh, ARM is our internal um, name for the Adobe Reader um, Acrobat updater technology. So this is something we just rolled out with this past release in April. Um, so uh, some of you, many of you may be familiar with the, um, the old Adobe Update Manager, which is still being used for a lot of our products. Um, we wanted to update the updater and, uh, and make the process, basically the update process, more smooth and, and streamlined. 
So that's what we did with the, the new updater, which allows you to uh, automatically install updates. There's, that's the first option. Uh, most people have the automatically download updates option chosen and you know let, let the user choose uh, when to install. And that's the legacy from the, from the previous updater. But we'd recommend um, people automatically install updates and choose that option. It's, it's kind of like the uh, Firefox updater, which downloads in the background and installs, and you don't have to do anything. Um, or you know, like Windows Update and all that, all that good stuff. So, so that's something that we um, really uh, put a lot of resources behind was just getting that to the point where we're going to get more people updated. Um, if you're an IT administrator, you can turn it off, obviously, and, and do your own updating, which is uh, what you'll continue to do. Um, so, so far, we've seen really, really positive numbers uh, in terms of the, uh, the uptake. So, so that's been really helpful. Does it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. So, so what we wanted to do is. Yeah, so um, if, if you have any further feedback, definitely definitely let us know. Um, so as far as uh, when we're going to turn it to, auto or if we're going to turn it to automatically install updates, certainly something under consideration. I mean, we're getting a lot of feedback, like the feedback you guys are giving us right now. Um, but, you know, the, the user choice right now, most of them have the uh, automatically download updates. We, we wanted to respect that as a starting point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to import that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So that that's something that's definitely under consideration. You know, we're looking at that, and um, it, it's it's something that's on our roadmap. So. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's 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 why we did this new updater. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I so I I would um, I would definitely argue that the point that it's not largely useless because you know it, it's downloading and it's um, on a more frequent basis and it's giving you the option to install. We're seeing people are are patching, so yeah. No, no, I don't, but. But yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the feedback and certainly something we're taking into consideration. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, that's that's another consideration. Obviously, is, is making the um, the update process um, smaller and, and smoother um, from that perspective. So. Yep. 
Right. Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, so Google is a you know it's a it's a new product. Chrome, it's a new product. Um, yep. Yeah, it's not something we want to spring on people. Yeah, but yeah, th I think yeah, I think the point was just you know it's an established product and um, yeah, so well, not something we want to just you know suddenly spray on the world. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. This is really a great discussion. I think we're just going to keep going to stay on track because I think we have about five minutes or so left. Um, so definitely come up to us afterwards, please. The feedback yep. is really helpful. Okay, um, and actually, I'm going to close out the case study. Um, as I think you've heard our theme along the way, and if you've uh, taken anything away from this, um, it's communication. And um, as tempting as it is to bury your head in the sand and try to run away from the problem, um, we all know you just you can't do that. That's not an option. Um, definitely have to take the time to communicate and engage with everyone. Um, customer input, definitely key. What are they seeing in the wild? How are they deploying updates? What are their pain points? Researchers, can't say enough. They're hugely important. Um, we appreciate everything that they provide to us. Uh, partners, antivirus companies, we want to help protect mutual customers, um, press and bloggers. You know, sometimes um, if they are not, uh, if, if we can't get our message out, sometimes they're the only ones that will. Um, and then, of course, being an incident response is just that, being uh, quick and ready to react. Uh, consistency is key. And um, especially in regards to communication, um, it definitely helps to be able to adapt quickly. Uh, to do so, we need to be proactive. We showed you our training. Um, we have a lot of different uh, processes in place to prepare for incidents such as this so we can act quickly. Um, but that being said, it's a constant learning process. Um, we definitely appreciate everyone's feedback. And um, Dave's going to talk about some of the things we're doing today. Yeah, so real quick, um, we are running out of time, if we haven't already. So, uh, but let me emphasize, um, we're still hiring, so uh, we're hiring a lot of people um, on the uh, the PCER tech side. We're hiring people um, kind of on the uh, the proactive side, SaaS um, tools, all, all kinds of stuff. So uh, if if you know of anyone, if you're interested, let me know. Um, we have secure product lifecycle SPLC. That's our equivalent of SDL. So we've got. Um, roadmaps for uh, for key products that just break it down kind of quarter by quarter um, and yeah a lot of support internally um, it, security is a process nobody's perfect obviously um, we we understand that and we're constantly evolving our process and um, trying to fine-tune it and make our customers happy so yeah so feel free to keep in contact with us so, like we, we receive vulnerability reports we also want to get feedback and um, as as one new was talking about, learn about your pain points, and obviously, if you're seeing anything in the wild, we want to hear about that as well. So, yeah, send sympathy cards and flowers. Um, we've got PCERT blog, the asset blog, um, new security portal. Uh, we're at conferences like this one. If you know of any good conferences, talk to us afterwards.
And yeah, so we've already started in the Q&A, so no iPhone, I've had questions. All right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's um, that's something that's under consideration. Um, so Flash is a little different, uh, just because it uh, we haven't seen the the level of attention um, on Flash that we have on Reader. Um, it's it's a big it's a big issue. It's it's out there on ninety eight percent of desktops. So uh, from that perspective, but um, just in terms of like attacks in the wild, right? Security research community and ex exploits in the wild. No, it ha it hasn't been so like exploits in the wild. We we just don't we don't see as many. We don't see zero days in, in Flash Player. You know, besides, um, you know, one, once in a while. Yeah, but I mean, to your point, it's 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 an important product, and it's something that we're uh, putting a lot of resources behind. So. We learn we learn a lot of lessons through reader. Yeah, again, it's not as big of an issue though because um, because the because the content is driving updates in the Flash case. Um, you know, websites are right. It's still an issue. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. If, if uh, by the way, if if anyone wants to go to another session, I think we're we're at that time. We blew through 420. So, yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So come on up and and talk if you want. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>